So it's not just to, to sort of learn about history for its own interest or its own sake, but it's really to make you a better practical uh, professional economist. But at the same time, I do think, for example, that paying more attention to the real world and how specific cases look and how sectors work, I think that that, for example, has more chance of, of being sort of incorporated more in how economics works. Uh, so I think it's sort of on different aspects, I, I see more or less a likelihood for, for change. Hey there, fellow Rethinker. Welcome back to the Rethinking Podcast, the place to learn about plural and diverse ideas in economics that you normally don't hear about. In this episode, we talk with Sam de Munk. Sam is the co-author of Economy Studies, a guide to rethinking economics education. Economy Studies provides a new coherent framework for economics education with a core philosophy, three leading principles, 10 building blocks, and seven practical tools to help you implement change. How do we implement this change? Sam explains it all in this episode. So let's get into it. Hey Sam, I'm so happy to have you on the podcast. Kind of great, kind of crazy because we had Yoros on previously because the book launch is coming up. How are you feeling about the book launch? Yeah, excited. Also nice to be here. And uh, yeah, can't, can't wait uh, to get the book out there. Are you ready for the book launch? What do you think? Not yet, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> We're still uh, working on a lot of things. Uh, website as well, videos, photos, uh, the launch itself. So, so lots to do, but, uh, but that's also part of it, I guess. Part of the fun. Awesome. So is it, is it going to be an in-person launch? Is it going to be online? Yeah, it's going to be both. Uh, both in-person and online, a hybrid. Uh, so for Dutchies who live in the Netherlands, it's, it's fairly easy to come by it since it's in Utrecht. But of course, for everyone else, it's easier to follow online through our website, uh, economystudies.com. So let's go a little bit to the beginning. For the people who haven't heard the conversation with you, what is, what is economy studies? Yeah, economy studies is a new approach to economics education. So we wrote a whole book, but it's also accompanied by a website and online uh, practical tools. And we really try to help teachers, professors, and also students to change economics education, whether it's their course they are personally following, or whether it's a program they are part of, or whether it's the national debate they are trying to change. Uh, so we really try to help give them tools, give them advice on, on what ways economics education could be better. So how did you get started in that? How did you how how did you get those skills even to be like I'm gonna change economic education? It's not something that I would be like oh this morning I woke up and I decided that this is what I'm gonna do. Yeah, I guess the initial motivation was frustration with my own program. Yeah, when I started studying economics fairly quickly, I was fairly dissatisfied. But I think a big part of it is sort of becoming part of the rethinking economics movement. And being uh, sort of learning through the whole, yeah, the whole movement and, and reading a lot on my own uh, as well. But, but also just sort of together running projects, seeing uh, how currently changes is, is sort of being triggered. And, and we just wanted to sort of help accelerate that. And with this project, yeah, we felt like we could, we could do that in, uh, yeah, we could sort of give our own uh, two cents to the debate. Yeah. So have you had feedback on the book already? Yeah, I think that was sort of part of the, the process of writing the book that we wanted. It's not just to be sort of our personal favorite hobbies and, and, and sort of <laughs> do what we personally like, but really make it a book uh, that is really for and also a bit by the movement. Uh, so we have been in contact with almost 200 uh, economists uh, and Damn, students. That's a lot. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a big part of sort of the process of writing the book. Like when we started, we sent out a big email asking uh, a lot of people, like, what do you think are like key principles for economics education? What are like amazing courses that are an example for other courses? Uh, and we drew on that and then we wrote sort of the first draft and, and had a whole uh, session of, of feedback, getting also like a small group of free thinkers coming to the Netherlands, having a whole weekend together, working on it. Uh, and then throughout the process, we emailed a lot more specialists in different fields for the suggestions, for example, on 
how to change monetary economics education courses. Yeah, so so a lot of lot of rounds of feedback and, and interaction. Uh, also trying out the ideas already in uh, applying it to to current programs. Uh, so for example, the the Freie Universiteit in Amsterdam uh, has been building a new program. So that was also a really amazing test case with of our ideas. Sort of if you apply it to actually make a real pro program. Uh, does it work? And, and and yeah, we sort of refined some aspects through that process, uh, learning by doing, so to say. Yeah. So how did that go? How do you build a bachelor? Yeah, it's a, it's a big, big process. So, so, so there are many, many steps involved, but I think what we really try to push is to sort of start from the question, what are you trying to prepare students for in terms of what skills and knowledge do they need uh, in their future careers? Often right now, there is sort of a fairly lazy approach when you create a new program. So often, for example, it's, it's just to prepare them for the masters. So just look at what are the requirements for the masters. And obviously, this is a sort of, it is necessary to, to have your students be able to go to the masters, but it's a fairly, yeah, it, you don't really ask how to prepare them for the real world and for their societal roles that they are going to have. So we really push that sort of aspect more to the front. And also just to, to ask the question rather than just do what is standard and just do that as well. So really, instead of just taking the standard textbooks and just say, well, we, we have a course with all the standard te textbooks, start from what do we students really need in their future societal roles and then start from there. So what are then skills and knowledge that are really important and how can you best teach those skills and knowledge? Uh, so it's really sort of reverse the logic. And then in the end, you will come up with some specific textbooks and teaching materials, but you don't start from there. That's sort of the end, the end point, not the beginning. So what's one skill that you wish you had learned that you now included in the book? Yeah, so many. I think one that I really would have liked to learn about is, is doing a scan of an economic sector. So for example, if you just want to know if you're going to work on a topic or whether, you, whether it's a, your business, you work in a company, for example, an energy company, how can you do a sort of relatively quick analysis, quick scan to have a rough idea of how this sector looks? What are the different actors? What are the different organizational forms? What are the different economic mechanisms? What are the sort of the key issues at the moment to sort of have this approach of just quickly understanding what is this sector all about? How does it function? How does it, is it structured? I think that this is really a useful, useful skill to have in whatever kind of future role you will work. It is, I think, a very, yeah, it, it, it helps you to sort of operate because you, then you know in which context and what field or system you are oper operating in. And right now, I just sometimes try to do it on my own, but since I haven't had any courses in it, it's, uh, it's a fairly difficult thing, yeah. So the book consists of three parts. You have foundations, you have building blocks, you have pillars. So you basically build one on top of the other, right? So, or, or do I see that wrong? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the foundations are sort of the, the more abstract approach, the more sort of general principles and ideas uh, on which we think sort of economics education should be, should be founded. And then the building blocks are more concrete sets of, of knowledge and skills, like what are really things that should be in there in an economics program. And then as third, the tools are really more sort of how to ap apply this in practice. So that is definitely sort of the last stop, step in the process. Yeah. So when it comes to the building blocks, something I was wondering about is, is the market all that economics is or should we focus broader than that? Yeah, yeah. Specifically, building block five is, is on this question. It's, uh, it's about economic organizations and mechanisms. And we also start exactly with a quote from Hajim Chang that, that says, indeed, the market is or the economy is bigger than the market. And currently, economics courses often seem to focus almost exclusively on markets. And then sometimes government intervention in the market is sort of brought in as sort of an exception or in page or in chapter, the last chapter of the book, if, if the market is imperfect, you can also do government intervention. 
But we really think, for example, if, if, if I would do such a sector scan of the energy sector, if you look around, you see a lot more than, than the simple supply and demand curves in markets. You actually see a lot of big, big firms. And if you look around in the world, for example, in the oil sector, there are many, many government or state-owned enterprises. So, so there are lots of varieties that it's not only market, but also hierarchies. But if you are on Wikipedia, uh, you are on the commons. So there are many different way- mechanisms that make up the economy. So, so we, we just think it's, it's important for students to realize this and to understand this whole economic system and not just one part of it that is called the market. Uh, that is interesting because I was wondering what you meant by economic mechanisms, but you mean not just the market, but also the commons, which is, how do you explain that? Yeah, Eleanor Ostrom uh, defines them, them very clearly uh, as a sort of common pool uh, resources where she says that they are, yeah, you can sort of put them in a, in a nice yeah, sort of table with, with two different ro- columns and rows. Uh, so they are rifle risks. So, so if one person uses it, then, then another one can still use it. So if, if you go on Wikipedia and I go there, that's fine. The, the main thing is sort of that for a lot of these mechanisms is, is that there is not just an exchange going on between three people, like I give you this and then you give me this, but it's also not hierarchy where there is a clear sort of command structure, whether it's your boss at your work or whether it's the government where you sort of just follow orders. And obviously that's a more complex relationship than just following orders, but that's sort of the hierarchical relationship. In commons, it's more of a horizontal relationship where people interact with each other without directly exchanging things, but it's more sort of a reciprocity often going on. There are social rules, as, as Anna Ostrom also clearly describes. And, and for example, if, if you look at, look at the, how different sort of natural resources have often been maintained, it's through these social norms, these informal rules that we sort of make sure that, that we don't overfish or don't have too many cattle on the grass and make sure that the the system is able to reproduce and that we can use it all. So that's economic mechanisms and then economic organizations are governments and companies or? Yeah, but also, of course, households and all kinds of different companies and also nonprofit organizations. So you have all kinds of uh, sort of, yeah, organizations out there, whether it's a cooperative, it's a foundation, It's a school, it's a hospital, which can be sort of private, public, can be a hybrid form. So there are all these different sort of organizations if you just look outside. And if you, for example, one of the exercises we we advise and I think can be really interesting is sort of just to ask or to give us exercise to students to look one day at all the things they do. So for example, you start with making breakfast for yourself. That's some unpaid labor to take care of yourself in a household. So this is a specific organization, specific economic mechanism. Then you take, for example, the bus to go to the university. Well, the bus, at least in the Netherlands, that's public transport. Uh, Then you go to university, which is sort of non-profit, partially public, but also increasingly privatized. So it's already a more complex thing. Then you go to the supermarket and you buy some food there which is, a, of course, a very capitalist, profit-oriented company. So you already see, like, in one day, when we do all the normal stuff we do, if you take sort of the effort to look at what kind of economic organizations and mechanisms are out there, then in one day, we already see so much more than just a market with supply and demand. Why is it that we haven't been looking at those then? Uh, whew, good question. Yeah, I think, I think it's a quite a long history of, of increasingly focusing on, on sort of mathematical models of, and, and specifically of, model, of, of markets that, that really have become dominant. If you think back, for example, at, at the early 20th century, institutional economics was fairly uh, very in- influential as, as an approach, and they were stressing all the different economic institutional forms that were out there. So, for example, early theories on, on why firms exist and why hierarchies work the way they do, also come a lot from this, this approach. So it's not as if this, this is all new and we invent this, like, like we did know about all these things before. But I think, yeah, the effort to sort of make everything into a model to analyze how we can make it more efficient and, and, and this, this way, really this way of thinking in terms of everything is always yeah, supply and demand or you can always optimize something 
yeah, I think has, has caused us to be blind to all these different organizational forms and, and mechanisms. So this book helps against the blindness. What are some common blind spots that you've noticed that this book helps or works against? Yeah, besides uh, the different organizational forms, it's also really about emphasizing to, to learn about the real world. So, for example, the sector scan I mentioned earlier is really about understanding the details and about the concrete specific situation that the sector is in. Uh, so it's not about a general law or theory or model that you can, can apply to anything, but it's really about knowing how the real world in a specific case looks. We really think that that's a highly important thing that is currently not not taught enough to students. Uh, and another big aspect is, is really learning to think about the values that, it, that are involved. So really ask the question, why is this important? And what are the sort of the moral dilemmas uh, that are involved in this economic issue? So whether it's, for example, the oil prices or the gas prices that are, of course, right now big in the news, what are the moral dilemmas of a higher or a lower uh, gas price? Why should the government intervene or should it not? Uh, and what are different yeah, principles to, to base these kind of decisions on? Because econom economists are often in the role of, of advising on these, how to tackle these kind of issues. And I think part of being a good advisor is, is being able to sort of identify the normative principles and the, the ethical dilemmas that are involved and then to also connect it to your more advanced economic theories and, and modeling the different mechanisms, how they would work or different policy options. But for that, you really need to know what is at stake and what are we trying to achieve. And that cannot be left just for the politicians or the philosophers. That's something that economists have to be involved in because they know how these economic uh, issues really work in their details. So they have to be able to identify how that relates to these normative aspects. Where do we see the normative aspects come back in the economic education that we have now? Do we see them? Where do they come back? Or do we not see them at all? Uh, currently, they are often sort of said that it's not there. Economics courses uh, programs often start with saying there is positive and there's normative economics. We are going to focus on positive economics and leave the normative aspects to the politicians and the philosophers. And then maybe there is an ethics course in, in the program. But if you look more closely, you actually see that often, for example, the principle of efficiency is there in courses. So how to calculate the optimal outcome in terms of Pareto efficiency is, is often sort of the normative goal that is sought after. And if you uh, are going to think uh, about policy options, that's sort of often the principle that is used and is taught. So there is some attention to this, but it's often sort of not made explicit or it's just put in this ethics course so we really think it's important to to bring it out make it explicit to talk about different ethical principles and really also apply them to specific questions so for example if there is a course on on for example oil then make it specific to that rather than just talk about the general philosophy or ethics uh, so really to to as economists to teach students to apply this and, and to sort of see this in the concrete cases they will be working on in their future careers so what's your favorite building block? Yeah. Do you have a favorite? Are you as an author allowed to have a favorite? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I guess like the, the, there is some difference. I, I, we have been working on a lot of them for a long time. So, so I think in a lot of them, we have our uh, like things that are very close to our heart. I think the, the building block we just talked about, building block five, economic organizations and mechanisms is really one that I like a lot. But another one that I really... Uh, cherish a lot is, is uh, building block two know your own economy since it's all about sort of it's it all sounds fairly straightforward and, and fairly easy but at the same time uh, we are really shocked by how it's almost never done in actual economics education so it's sort of no one does it while it seems so obvious to actually do it so it's just about learning about for example in the Netherlands what are how does the Dutch economy look like uh, what institutions does it have what structures what sectors what are the different big actors in it? Uh, how does, for example, the inequality in the Netherlands look? What are the big statistics? How big is GDP? How big is the government budget? How does it relate? How is healthcare in the Netherlands organized? Just learn about all these practical things, which is, yeah, almost never done, uh, which is, I found fairly weird that when I graduated as a Dutch uh, economics student, I, I have never learned of the main economic institutions in the Netherlands. 
yeah i think if if you talk to family and friends if i say that to them they they often think i lie uh, because it sounds too <laughs> ridiculous but it, but it's, it's for a weird reason it seems to be the case not only in the netherlands but pretty yeah in most economics programs so do you think they just assume it's like common knowledge then yeah, we have had many discussions with, with economists. That's, that's sometimes an answer. Sometimes it's more in a normative sense that they say it should be common knowledge. Uh, so if perhaps students don't know it now, but it's their own job to learn about this in their, their spare time in the weekend and in the evenings, <laughs> they should read about this. But I'm not going to do it because that's often the argument that they say, like, they are never going to learn about these complex mathematical models. No one wants to do that in their weekend. But learning about, for example, how wages are negotiated in the Netherlands, that's, that's interesting. So students could do that in their, their spare time. I'm going to do what they are never going to do and just make sure that they find my class boring. That's sort of the, the often the, the, the argument we get. That sounds like a terrible argument. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, think, we think it's often counterproductive because, yeah, we, we get it. Like, I, I, I agree. I think almost no one will on their Sunday afternoon go and will work on these mathematical models. Uh, no. But at the same time, also almost no one is going to read up on, on how wages are negotiated in the Netherlands. That also doesn't happen. So if you really leave it completely sort of for, for students to do in their spare time, it's not going to happen. You're not going to learn them to to find this information to ask the question uh, and also to trigger their interest because i think if you start with the world around them economics is way more interesting than if it's just an abstract model and if it's just about the mathematical and the technicalities so so we really think that it's going to sort of strengthen their understanding also of models because when you really for example know a bit more about how dutch wages are negotiated and then look at all the labor economics models, then they make way more sense. And then you see the really the relevance sort of and, and, and the meaning of, of, of the outcomes or the assumptions that are in there. So, so we really think there is not always a trade-off, but just making time to, to look at the real world can, can also help with understanding the theories better. So the building blocks three and four both focus on history. Why is it so important to know the history? Yeah, I think the, the quote we, we also uh, use in the book from uh, Robert Heilbronner really captures why it's really important. Uh, he says, we cannot help but living uh, in history, we can only fail to be aware of it. And I think this really captures sort of the, the, the key reason why it's important. Like everything that happens is in history. So it has a re- it, it, the, the current situation has emerged from the past and also will lead up to a new future. So that's really an abstract way of saying, learning about how these things have emerged as really understands, helps you understand sort of the current situation that you're in. And at the same time, also that, that, that applies to sort of the problems that we look at. So for example, if you look at climate change, it really, really helps if you understand how uh, the energy sector has changed over time and how pollution has increased and how our economies and policy making apparatuses have have reacted to this uh, and that really helps you to sort of being a better economist whether you work at a company or a government to give good advice on what to do next so it's not just to to sort of learn about history for its own interest or its own sake but it's really to make you a better practical uh, professional economist uh, and also learning about the ideas that we have and how they emerged and where they come from and what situation because often if you if you if you don't learn about this it's sort of yeah, that you are not really able to situate it in a specific historical context. So you just, yeah, you just have your model and you can just apply it to everything, but you really need to learn about how to apply this in practice and their history helps a lot. So is economic history and history of economic thought, are those, because they're different building blocks, how do they differ then? The first one, economic history, is, is the history sort of of the real economy, the real world. So that can be the oil sector, but also just how the Dutch economy emerged, for example. And uh, the fourth one, building block uh, for history of economic thought and methods is more about our thinking, whether it's economists or other people. So how do we think about the economy? So, So it's not the real thing itself, but sort of what happens in our minds we think about the market or whether we think about government intervention, what kind of logics do we have? What kind of ideas are prevalent? 
And where do these models that we use as economists, where do they come from? Uh, so the one is about the real world and the other one is about IDs. So after studying economics for four years, am I thinking about economics wrong? Probably. <laughs> How? Uh, In what ways? Yeah, we as 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 I think uh, this this whole conversation already sort of spills out a number of ways. Uh, so, for example, that that it's not just about the market, but it's about all these other things, whether it's hierarchies or comments or reciprocity. But that also that it's that it's also about sort of the normal normative dilemmas that are in there. Uh, but also that you can think about the economy through different theories. Uh, so. Thinking in a neoclassical way is, is one way of approaching this. So assuming people are rational, optimizing their utility, markets lead to optimal equilibrium or imperfect uh, and, and suboptimal equilibrium. This is one way of approaching it. But you can have many, many other approaches, whether you come from the post-Keynesian approach, the feminist approach, ecological, evolutionary, Marxian or Austrian. There are so many different ways of thinking about the economy. Uh, and our point is not that one is good and one is bad, but really that students should learn about them and especially sort of apply it to problems. So when you talk about the labor market, talk about the most relevant approaches to understanding the labor market, and then let students themselves judge whether once they tackle a specific issue, which insight really helps them most to, to tackle this or solve this problem. So yeah, we think it's it's quite a quite a big difference from the current situation, but we are hopeful uh, and we're seeing more and more change in economics programs. So so perhaps in in a, in a couple of years when you uh, when the new generation graduates, it, it will be better. So you have ten building blocks and they all kind of stack up. Do you have to follow them one to ten? Can you pick which one you like? How does that work? Yeah, you can do them in what order you, you want. Uh, and in, in principle, also the book is really written in a way of sort of, yeah, you can, you can agree with building block two and disagree with building block four. And that's fine. And use them as, as, you, as you think it's, it's most useful for, for the program or the course you are in. We do really think that all 10 of them are important for education, educating economists and really preparing them for their future roles. So we would argue they are all important. I would say they are not all equally important. There, there are really bigger ones and smaller ones. Uh, for example, the history ones are, I think, important, but economic theories in general, learning about analytical thinking is, is, I think, rightfully already way bigger in the current programs. And I think they should be giving, getting more attention than, than history. Uh, so it's, so it's, there, there are definitely uh, differences between how important they are and when they should come in in programs. But it's really meant as a sort of, a menu of options. We give an overview of all these different skills and knowledge, including with teaching materials to how to implement them. So it's, yeah, it's, it's not up to us, of course. We are not in the curriculum committee of every university. So the people who are in all those curriculum committees and, and are making these courses, all the professors and teachers, they are the ones that really have to judge what is best for them. Uh, but we just hope to help them with that. So building block nine, problems and proposals, how do I, how did you change a course into something that has this building block? Yeah, good question. Uh, perhaps that was also the most difficult one for us uh, to write. We, we quickly, or we, at some point, we realized how important it is uh, to sort of let students practice and, and learn these skills and, and, and just doing it. So just ask them to analyze a problem. Just push them to write a proposal or to evaluate their existing proposal. But how to do this in practice and what works best, sort of, I think, I think a lot more experimenting in different courses should be done with this. I think this, unfortunately, really some, yeah. Yeah, I think, if, for example, in business education, it's, it's way more normal to, to have practical case studies and, and let students go to a company and, and look at an issue. And unfortunately, in economics education, that's really not a normal thing to have in your program, even though we think it's really useful. So, so we think that if we would experiment more, we can also learn some more about what are really best practices to do this. Yeah, we, we wrote something up which we think is useful, but I think, yeah, especially on this, this building block, a lot of learning can still be done. And then the top block, 
is I'm not going to go through all of them, promise. But the top blog is Economics for a Better World. So to me, that sounds like the economics you can dream up and then, or the economy you dream up, and then that's the one you're aiming for. Is that what the building block is about? Not really, but it could be part of it. It's really about sort of asking why we do economics and thinking about the, the normative uh, aspects of it. So I think every economist is aiming for a better world. Uh, no one wants to make the world a worse place. And that's sort of, that's their motivation to, to, to make everything a mess and to make people's lives worse. Everyone wants to make it better. But the question, of course, is what do you mean by better? What are you specifically aiming for? What is sort of your normative principle that you base it on? Or what is your utopia, if you want to put it in a more sort of abstract system uh, level? Uh, and we think it's important for students to, to not just have this implicitly in their minds or have this sort of behind or between the lines, but just talk about this. What are different normative principles you could base a decision on? So it could be efficiency, Pareto efficiency. That's what, that's what your goal is. But if you talk to, to citizens around you, what are things they find important? For example, they could say it's really important that there is reciprocity uh, in a normative sense. If I give you this, then I think you also are, are worthy of getting something as well. For example, if you think about unemployment uh, benefits, this is often if you ask in a surveys what citizens find fair. So, so just ask these different things. What, what do really people find important? And to as, as economists, that helps us think in a more broader and a more meaningful way to, to advise sort of on all these issues that we, that we have. And part of that is also indeed about sort of imagining a different economic system. So if we say we don't like the current system or we see big issues, whether it's with inequality, climate change or financial instability or whether it's with a pandemic, then think about, okay, so what kind of different way could a system look? And what are sort of the, the visions or for a new economy that that, that, that could, be, could lead to? And, and the goal there is not to sort of say, this is the right one and now students should just agree with me being the professor and, and, and they should just follow, follow my normative ideas. The goal is rather to, to expose them to different normative visions, different principles you could have, and then let them themselves critically think what they think is works best. And I think the goal is, at least for me, like it's, it's really not to create ideologues. At the same time, I think it's fine if someone is really convinced by some vision. Like, I'm not going to say that's wrong, but I think the goal is not to, to say, okay, we sh show you five options, now pick one. I think it's really <laughs> okay if, if people like me, for example, I'm, I'm very often a bit doubting, like, oh, I like some of this idea. I think this principle has some merit, but also some downsides. And I think that sort of more nuanced understanding of visions and principles, I think it, it can be really helpful for future economists if they go into the real world. How do you name these building blocks? Because you got them building blocks, you figured out kind of what you wanted to say in there, but how did you figure out what to name them? Yeah, I wouldn't say that's always that order. Sometimes it starts more with the name. So for example, building block nine, problems and proposals. It was really, we did, the name was there first and then we I had to think a lot about what, what actual content would be underneath it. But I think it's often trying out, also asking people for feedback, uh, so, for example, first we had one building block that was called capitalism because we thought, well, if you want to understand the economy, capitalism is pretty big. But then through some feedback from others was like, well, wait, wait, capitalism is important, but it's just one political economic system. And then we, yeah, we changed the content and, and the name as well. So it's sort of often this, this more ir ir interactive and iterative process of sort of we try something, we have some idea, we put it down on paper. We discuss it with each other, with other people, and then we try to come up with the best way of doing it. Did you find that important, that the discussions were there, that people were willing to listen and speak? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think also for me, that sort of makes the process way more fun. That, that nothing, and I think I also really like working with Joris in this way, that I think we are both capable of sort of letting go of old ideas that we might have become like really attached to. But then it's like, well, but we have a better idea now. So we just change it. And, and we sort of kept changing a lot of things. So for, I think we began with six building blocks, for example. We shuffled things around, changed names, changed content, and, and to sort of, yeah, come up with this best thing. And I think, yeah, helping 
it was really helpful to to have other people involved in that process to to see things that we didn't see in the beginning yeah because you wrote it together with yours what was that like to co-write a book uh very good i i'm i'm 100 sure i wouldn't have done this my, on my own and 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 that is like with yours but also indeed with the broader movement i think with just two of us we also wouldn't have have built this book I think I think on many levels, like the content just gets better. You you are only one mind, so you you think of one a couple of things, but not of others. Uh, and also in terms of skills, for example, I'm a bit more of the nerdy guy who likes to go and read all these different theory books and 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 sort of summarize those different theories. While yours is a bit more about also the narrative of the book, make sure that it's actually understandable for, for readers and interesting introduction, for example, uh, that that's sort of, there is a, a very natural sort of division of labor t- between us where we can tr- strengthen each other. So I think, and, and also just on having fun, having someone to discuss ideas with, being really going through the process together when you have a setback or whether it's just a long process, like it, it's just way more fun, yeah, than, than doing this all on your own. I, I think I wouldn't enjoy it. <laughs> So then what was, because the book took three years, I think I got that right, right? Yeah. yeah. Three years in the making. What was the hardest part of creating the book? Ooh. Um, good question. The hardest part. I think the hardest part was really to move from more abstract vague ideas to to written out text to really all put it down and to sort of work to all the issues that come up if you really yeah spell it out put it in in, in full text and and work through all the details of the arguments and of, of the aspects that that was initially also we planned to to get it done way quicker than than we ended up doing <laughs> Uh, I think in the end, still three years for a book, uh, almost 500 pages is, I think, not too bad. But but still, we, we thought like, oh, we, we have these general ideas in mind. So we had a lot of the titles, for example, for the building blocks in mind. But then you have to really write them out in a, in a way that is really easy for people to understand and for teachers to, to be like, oh, okay, this is helpful. I can now use this for my own course and apply it that step was really a lot more difficult than we initially thought and, and that took more time but at the same time there's also a lot of new ideas and new things came up during that process so it was also really fun it was not just like a struggle that was tough but but it was just a process that we took way longer than expected so what is then what is the hard part about having the ideas and then putting them down on paper uh, i think the, the the main thing we yeah, we ran up against is just realizing that actually, yeah, you have some fake ID, but if you want to write it down in detail, then a lot of other questions come up. So saying, yeah, you should learn to, uh, you should let students practice with analyzing problems and, and, and letting them write proposals. If you say it like that, it's fairly easy and, and it sounds straightforward. But then if you say, okay, now write 10 pages on that and what specific aspects to teach to students uh, and, and which teaching materials for that to use. And then it becomes a lot more difficult, like, oh, well, wait, what does that really entail? And why is it really important? And what aspects does it have? And where can I really find sort of exercises or materials that are useful for that? Uh, that's that's really quite a, quite a big step. And I think also that's sort of and not only for us, but if I look, look around in the rethinking economics movement, like I think it's fairly... Sometimes also for teachers, we often get back like, yeah, yeah, it's nice. You say you want all those things, but how do you do that? And, and that, that, that question of how do you do that is often quite tricky. Like, it's nice to say you want pluralism or you want the real world to be taught. Uh, but, but doing that in practice is often quite tricky if you want to do it well. So, so I think with writing out the full text, we, we sort of, yeah, had to work our way through that and really think. So if you now give a course one-on-one economics, what do you actually include and do not include? And how do you make that decision really work work through that uh, in a systematic way? That, that was sort of a very tough, but also fun pro- part, yeah, uh, process that we hope we can sort of help others get through that process a bit quicker than us. <laughs> so what is harder to decide what to put in or what to leave out? Yeah, um, 
I think for us, it was more difficult to be really clear on what to put in. I think what to take out is sort of, you have to be clear on what your priorities are. So what is really the goal of economics education? What are, the, what are you preparing students for? Uh, we, for example, also looked a lot at like surveys among professional economists and also employers of economists to just see what people say that are really experienced and also in different situations, different contexts, different countries. What do they say economists need? And then from there, I think you can, you get a lot of clear answers that a lot of employers and a lot of professional economists are really clear saying, uh, actually, we learn too much mathematical techniques and skills. Most of us don't need this in practice. So, so we could do with less in the, our economics pro, uh, uh, programs. And the same counts for economic uh, theories in terms of neoclassical economic theories, sorry. Uh, that, that we get a lot of that and, and, and the reactions to surveys are pretty clear that that could be less. Uh, so that's often just not a very nice message for a lot of professors and teachers that can be a, quite a tough pill to swallow. But I think it's a fairly easy, straightforward message while saying, okay, we want uh, students to understand how values are important, how the real world is important, how different ways of organizing is important. That's, that's a bit more difficult to, to then say, so what do you actually bring in specifically? Uh, that, was, that was way more work. So I'm curious, there is this chapter in the book for non-economists. Why did you include a chapter for non-economists and what can they get out of that? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the importance is really sort of striking if you look at how many people get an economics course, whether it's in high school or whether it's in their program. Those are a lot more people than, than the actual people who take a full economics program at a university. So if you look at, look at just the number of people that get this kind of education, it's, it's really, it's not minor, it's pretty big. <laughs> and, and we also think it's really important to sort of for the public debate around economics and also for people, their personal lives to sort of help them understand better how the economy works. And I think the concept that was put forward in the book, Econocracy, that is called Citizen Economists, Economists, as I think a really useful one there. To, to really help sort of prepare people to, to, as citizens, really being able to engage in debates, whether it's at their company or the organization they work at, to sort of understand how the, the structures there work and have some idea. And of course, you can't like give them all the economics books in the world, uh, but to really give them at least some good basis to think about this and also just to help them ask questions and ask about these different aspects, whether it's the different sort of ways of organizing a company or a household, or whether it's uh, the normative dilemmas that are involved to, to really just help people see those aspects and ask questions about them and, and think for themselves. So with every guest, we do a little lightning round. So I ask a question and you just say the first thing that comes up. Well. Okay. What is the skill any economist should learn? Uh, analyzing problems. Who do you admire or look up to in economics? Currently, mostly Adam Tooze. Who's that? <laughs> uh, it's a very famous, uh, or it's increasingly famous uh, economic historian. And he used to write a lot about uh, sort of the sort of early 20th century, how statistics came up, how uh, the Nazi economy worked and, and, and how uh, sort of the US became dominant after the First World War. Uh, or not dominant, um, but but recently he has written uh, also very recent history books. So he just published a book on the Corona crisis, which is sort of the book right now on like understanding the last years from an economic point of view. But he also has sort of written the book about the financial crisis and understanding the last decade. So so he seems for me at least it's a really striking example of understanding the real world. Uh, and understanding sort of how the, our economic systems with all their different aspects, how they hang together, how events happen, what are sort of structural diff, uh, reasons for change or what are the debates in, in key policy uh, organizations. To, so I think, I think he's just really, yeah, impressive and really interesting to read, to sort of understand that the economy we live in and how this is changing. Uh, and I think he just had a lot of sharp points and analysis that, that allow you to say, see things you, you didn't be, do before. What is the question you want me to ask that I haven't asked you yet? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Good question. 
One thing I, 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 I think is also perhaps interesting to discuss is, is sort of how the future role of economists in societies would change if we would educate, educate them differently. Because we really think that that's because education is currently fairly focused, yeah, very focused on these more mathematical and technical skills, one way of thinking, following neoclassical assumptions. Uh, the role economists have in societies are, are also following a bit from that approach. Uh, so they often sort of are all about applying this approach. We are sort of the calculators and what is the optimal. We do cost benefit analysis for you. And, and, and this is what we do. And we think really that, that the role economists have in society can really change a lot if they take a more pragmatic approach and if there are really more a diversity of economists. So you have economists that are still really good at doing the math, running the models, and, and, and really that aspect that is currently really emphasized. But at the same time, that you also have economists that are really specialized are in doing, for example, qualitative case studies and really looking, doing interviews and doing field work. And others are really focused on thinking more creatively about what economic institutions can we have? How can we differently organize, for example, our healthcare sector or whether it's uh, our, our sort of the pharmaceutical industry? How can we think differently about organizing our, our vaccine production or, or, uh, or distribution? Uh, and other ones that are really specialized in, in these more putting it in social and historical context to really seeing the links or the political aspects of things and other ones really focusing on the moral dilemmas and being able to spell that out and make us understand that better. So I think that if, if I think about sort of how, what roles economists can play and also how that sort of changes their role to, to other social and natural scientists and how they and other professional groups that are also influential in, in how we make policy or how we make decisions in companies and organizations I think that, that that is really sort of where a big change can happen and, and, and also where I really get motivated to, to work on changing economics education. That, that vision really, uh, yeah, motivates me because I think that can help us, yeah, tackle the problems we all have, yeah, tackle them better. How did you keep your motivation if you're working on it for so long and sometimes it feels like it's just stuck? How do you keep your motivation trying to change economics? Yeah, I think I think it's really coming from this this sort of seeing the relevance of it. I think that for me on a personal level really motivates me. Yeah, if I if I think it's gonna have an impact, then then I can think I can yeah be pretty nerdy long for a long time, just work like a, like a monk almost, like uh continue just to work, like apply it to this topic as well, then apply it to this topic and, and just continue. But I think it's also just sort of I said, like not doing it alone, but being part of a group, having sort of feedback coming from different angles, trying it out at a university. That all makes the process, of course, way less boring than, than if it's just you on your own at your own table uh, writing every day. Uh, so it was a lot more dynamic than, than that. Yeah. What do you want to tell present and future economics students? Oh, yeah, I would say really... Think about what you want to learn and, and, and look for where you can learn it. And, and that might be outside of your program. That might mean that you, that you will have to change programs or that you, you will have to read some stuff on your own. But really, if you think about what you want to do in the future, what kind of skills and knowledge you probably are going to need for that, and make sure that you, yeah, that you get them and that you look, look for them and, and Obviously, that can be a difficult question. You can also just go from like, what am I interested in and where can I learn more about that? But the thing I would really not do is assume that the professor knows best and just follow what they have put in place for you. I think, yeah, the, the key thing about academic education is that you become an independent and critical thinker and learn for, yeah, think for yourself and, and make decisions on your own. And, and that doesn't mean like that you should reject everything from your professor and that should listen to him, but you just think critically and, and don't assume he's always or she is always right, but just ask questions and, 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 and go look for it. And I mean, obviously it would be awesome if, if you're also motivated to become a part of rethinking economics and become part of the movement for change. But I guess that's, that's sort of a next step that in, 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 your, in, in the process. You have to be motivated first, of course, before going to do that. Do you have any tips for someone who wants to raise their 
hand in class or wants to be critical but doesn't really know how to do that because they don't feel certain enough of their opinion or their question yeah yeah definitely i think one one chapter in the book is really aimed uh, to help people with that it's called adapting existing courses because often we are in a course whether it's labor economics or financial economics yeah you are just starting in this course so you don't know yet what is not taught and what is left out and and, and so so it's often very difficult indeed to to ask these questions and in this these chapters we sort of lay out what is currently not taught but could be taught uh, so it's really sort of a guide both for teachers and for students uh, to, to sort of see what is not there yet, uh, but could be there. So we hope with that sort of it becomes way more easy for students to just take that chapter with them, perhaps read it and then like be, yeah, be, but that can perhaps already be enough to, to ask your question, like, why don't we discuss, for example, the moral uh, principles or dilemmas involved in, in, in thinking about the minimum wage? Uh, but it can also just be like going to your professor in the break and say, here, here you have this chapter or this little booklet. Why don't you take a look at it and, and, and think about it? Because then you don't need to be the expert yourself because you're a student. You are not an expert by definition <laughs> because you're still learning. And, and that is fine. But that does, we hope that with that, we can sort of help you still uh, ask a question. And I think on a more personal level, I think it's sort of, yeah, getting over the, the fear of asking a question and, and having everyone look at you. I also, for example, uh, when I started, I, I was in classes of 500 people and it can be quite, quite intimidating of then asking the question and everyone looks at you and the professor is angry for you asking this critical question. So, so in a more social or personal level, that, that, that can be tough. Uh, but I think there it really can help if you are with a group. If you are not alone, but you are with some other people or some other students, find, find them around, uh, look at whatever there is a local rethinking and economics group, because asking your hand uh, or raising your hand and asking a question or asking to the professor if you can talk about something. Uh, if you do that together with someone, it becomes way more fun and light and doable than, than if it's just you on your own being a weirdo uh, looked at by everyone else. That's, that's less fun of a process. <laughs> So final question, what does the future of economics look like according to you? I guess uh, I could say there are different scenarios I can, I can see, see going. Uh, so, so I can like give a very optimistic outlook, which I sometimes believe in, but often just more hope for. <laughs> but at the same time, I, I also have some, yeah, some very more pessimistic moments where I'm like, I'm not sure any, anything is going to change. But I think on the whole, what I do already see changing in more and more places is, is that the recognition that the current state of economics, both the education, but also the research and the policy making, is not sort of, yeah, should be changed. And it's not really up to, yeah, it's, it's not right for the moment. Uh, and, and more and more professors, economists are seeing the need for change. But on the question of how much change, what kind of change specifically, there are, of course, many, many different ideas and debates. So I'm, for example, I'm really, really pushing on this, but I'm, I'm not so optimistic that it will change. That sort of the dominance of, of this focusing on models, focusing on technical skills. I'm, I'm afraid that this will stay dominant for at least the foreseeable future. Although I would like to see a change. But at the same time, I do think, for example, that paying more attention to the real world and how specific cases look and how sectors work. I think that that, for example, has more chance of, of being sort of incorporated more in how economics works. Uh, so I think it's sort of on different aspects, I, I see more or less a likelihood for, for change. But I think on the whole, it's of course also not set in stone. Like I don't think the future is, is sort of, can be sort of fully predicted. If, if we as rethinkers, for example, really are able to put more pressure on, on the discipline and on the education, that, that could mean that that will lead to change. Uh, so, so I also don't think like it's about looking in the glass bowl and, and to see the future i think it's really something we influence ourselves so, so yeah let's let's be part of the future and change it awesome words well thank you so much for being on the podcast Sam. thank you thank you for listening to the rethinking podcast hit the follow button on your platform so that you stay up to date with all we have in store for you share this episode with someone you think should definitely hear this you can also find Rethinking Economics and L on social media. Just click the links down below. Until next time, we'll rethink again soon.